Hi everybody in Miata internet land, this is Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata. And today we're gonna to talk about a new cool feature that's coming on the 2022 Miatas called kinematic posture control. Now kinematic posture control is basically a way to use the brake system to make the car corner flatter. It's a very cool trick. It uses existing hardware in the car. There's no new hardware involved. Um, it's just simply a matter of using existing sensors, using existing information, and uh, in a different way to give the car a slightly different dynamic twist, one that we haven't seen before. So, what is it? How does it work? We're gonna start with a little suspension theory, not hardcore, but we're gonna talk about something called anti-squat. When you accelerate, your car squats at the back. I mean, that's just weight transfer, moving back, compressing the rear springs. Does, depending on your suspension design, it's possible to design the suspension so that it basically pushes back against that, drives the wheels into the ground, lifts the back up a little bit, and drag racers can actually have more than 100% anti-squat. They'll actually lift at the rear under hot acceleration. There's a bunch of other side effects of this, interesting things it does for dynamics. What we're interested in is the fact that basically it's effectively lifting pushing these wheels down into the ground, lifting the car under acceleration, but that means under braking, when the torque's going the other way, it has a tendency to try to lift the wheel. That's the important part. What Mazda's done is they have used the ABS system effectively, their control of brakes on all four wheels, to take the inside wheel in the middle of a corner and add just a little bit of brake that pulls that wheel up and makes the car corner flatter. It's similar in concept to some of the yaw control, some of the dynamic, or some of the torque distribution that's being done to pretend that you've got an LSD, to try to get a, a, a car that normally would understeer to torque into a corner. But in this case, it's a very small amount of brake torque. And it's just enough, like I said, to lift that wheel up a little bit and pull the car flatter. It's a really neat trick. Um, it's coming on the 2022s. We have not had a chance to drive this yet. But I did have a chance to talk to Dave Coleman, one of Mazda's main chassis engineers, about how it works and how it feels. So, I mean, you'd think that the basic thing would be it makes the car corner flatter. But Dave says that he's had a chance to drive this. Um, he says it, it, uh, it gives the car a more planted feel, especially in high-speed corners, and gives it better turn-in, gives it better, a little more steering response on the, on the corner in which I find very interesting side effects of this. I think there's a little bit of torque distribution going on. When you drag on this wheel a little bit, it pushes more torque to the outside wheel. That'll help drive the car around the corner. Not a huge amount. They're not using it for torque distribution primarily, but I think there's a small effect there. Um, but effectively, it makes the car feel better in fast corners and, uh, and a little more stability. How does he? A little more linear steering response on turn in to apex, so on the entry of the corner. He says it's more stable coming out of the corner as well. So I'm looking forward very much to testing this. Uh, Dave's comment was basically the Miata's always been a very good car at lower speeds, tighter corners. This gives it a little more ability in the faster sweepers where it's always been a little weaker. And it also allows the car to corner flatter without having to put in bigger sway bars with the side effects that that has on the car. So, neat trick. So some of the questions that we've had on this. How does it work? I think hopefully I just covered that. Um, I believe it is standard on all the 22s. It's not available on any of the earlier cars, which is why we haven't driven it yet. Mazda hasn't delivered any 22s to North America yet at this point. I don't even think they're, they've got press cars out there yet. Um, but that is, that is the, that's what's coming. Um, the neat thing is because it involves no new hardware, it adds no weight. Um, so it's, it's basically an invisible thing. It's just a software tweak. One of the questions we've had is, since it is just a software tweak, can it be retrofitted to an ND1 and ND2, basically all of the ND Miatas? And I suspect the answer to that is technically yes, but realistically no, because it's gonna be buried deep into the dynamic stability control module. That's not a module that really can be programmed, I don't think, outside Mazda, maybe not even inside Mazda. Can you swap that part out from an earlier car into this one? Maybe, I don't know. Um, but I suspect it's buried deep enough into the system that it would be hard to, hard to get in there. And it's hard to mess with the dynamic stability control because it is very dependent on extremely high-speed communication on the car's networks. And if you insert yourself into that, you can insert enough of a delay to basically put the system into a failure mode. We have discovered this ourselves doing our NDV8 uh, research over the years. So it's a difficult system to try to mess with. So, um, 
Dave says that the, the amount of effect this has, because this is one of my questions to him, is how big an effect does this have? How much do you notice it? He says it's about equivalent to the difference between the factory um, base suspension and the factory club suspension. So the Bilstein versus the, the standard suspension, which is, I mean, it's not a night and day difference. It's a nice, noticeable difference. You can get jump car to car. You can feel the difference in how they move down the road. Um, so he's saying that's equivalent sort of improvement or change to the car's dynamic behavior. Okay, so the question is, how do you know when KPC has been activated? Again, we haven't driven this. We don't anticipate a big warning light on the dashboard because it's not like dynamic stability control intervening and trying to save your life. Mike, you have a follow-up question? Well, You're waving at me. It's related. Like, how does, when does it actually happen? Like, okay. Like, Mazda, say, the G-forces, you know, at this extent activated? Like, why does the system know that KPC needs to be engaged? Okay, so the other question is, how does the car know that it should be doing something? And basically, it's my understanding that it's doing it on differential wheel speeds. And I would not be surprised if the steering rack angle was in there as well. But if the inside wheel, you know, the, when you're going around a corner, your wheels are going different, different distances. So you have a, your outside wheel turning faster than your inside wheel, and it's probably using that as a primary trigger because that means you are going around a corner. Um, no matter what you're doing with the steering wheel, if your two wheels are moving at different speeds, that's what's going on. So it will do a very light, it's only about 45 pounds of brake line pressure, which really is very, very little. It's a light brush um, on the inside wheel. So it won't warn you it's happening. It's not saving your life. It's just a little dynamic tweak. Um, and it will do it in those corners so that it should be invisible to the driver. And that's Mazda's usual concept with stability control, that kind of thing, is to try to make it as invisible as possible. One of the questions that we've had is, how is it like Mazda's G-vectoring control, which they use on some of their other vehicles? And it's a similar concept in terms of it's something invisible that happens in the background that has a noticeable but small effect, but it works completely differently. The G-vectoring control is effectively a slight lift of the throttle on turn-in. Um, very quick, just enough to put a few more pounds on the front wheels, and then you're back on. Apparently, it's almost undetectable. Most importantly, it's not on Miatas, so I mean, that's an important thing. Um, so... Uh, it is, it is a similar concept in terms of let's use the control we have over the chassis. Let's use all the existing parts to do something neat, but uh, it is a, a very different sort of effect. So we did have some questions about um, suspension geometry, aftermarket control arm parts, that sort of thing. Because this relies on the anti-squat geometry built into the Endymiata, um, if you mess with the control arm pickup points, you may this may actually have the exact opposite effect, if, depending on what you move around and how far. If you build negative anti-squat into the suspension, which basically means that the wheels drive the body down when they accelerate, um, you may end up actually increasing the roll. You'd have to do a lot of fairly significant moving of control arm mounting points. This means changing the subframes. Um, so aftermarket control arms should not make a difference, but if you start changing subframes out, be aware. Um, once you start messing with suspension geometry, this is just one more pitfall that awaits you. So could it be, one question is, could it be retrofitted to previous generations of Miatas if they had ABS and an aftermarket BSC module? Interesting question. Um, it could not be retrofitted to an NA or NB Miata because they have a three-channel ABS system. They cannot activate the rear brakes independently. They can only do them together. Uh, the NC, potentially. Um, I mean, I could see how that could work. Again, you get into the speed of the, of the system. Can you do it fast enough for it to work well and be subtle enough? And honestly, I'm not 100% sure that there's anti-squat built into the NC. I suspect there is. I have not analyzed that part of the suspension, but that would be necessary for it to work. ND, we've mentioned that. Can it be retrofitted? Technically, yes. In reality, probably not. Uh, and the other question that we've had a couple of is, what, does it, what effect does it have on the actual brakes? Will it overheat the brakes more quickly? Will it cause excessive brake wear? Again, we go back to it's only 45 pounds of pressure, and that's not really very much for brake line pressures. That's usually measured in, you know, I think dynamic uh, stability control systems will use 10 times that. Um, so it's very, very small amount of braking. It's just like a little brush. So it's unlikely to generate enough heat to be a significant problem. If you're running the 25 hours of Thunderhill, you might see it. Um, but I would say for general, general street use, it's highly unlikely you'll notice a difference in brake pad wear because it's such a, such a light thing. So the question is what happens basically if you've got wheel spin going on? If, you're, if you've got one wheel on gravel, one wheel on ice, um, does the KPC kick in? If it's using the steering wheel sensor, I would say probably not. Um, 
it actually would have a bit of a beneficial effect. I don't know, because it's going to transfer the wrong way. It's going to, um, I don't think it's going to be enough to do actual torque vectoring to have a significant uh, effect. It's possible it might trigger in those situations. You've probably got your dynamic stability controls triggered in that situation anyway, trying to deal with the wheel spin so it knows that something else is going on. Um, that's an excellent question. We may not find out until we get one of these things so we can actually play with it, or somebody who is inside the car's brain knows. But that's obviously a situation that happens, so I'm pretty sure Mazda was able to work around it. They certainly have the ability to make those sort of determinations. A lot of the same sort of math and figuring was used for the early ND's tire pressure monitoring system. It used the existing sensors, it used the wheel speed sensors, the steering angle sensor to do tire pressure calculations based on the relative diameters of all tires, including when you're going around a corner, what the relative speed should be on the inside and outside tire. It was a creepy system because it could spot when you change the size of all four tires. No sensors in the wheels. It was a very clever system. They've moved away to a direct sensor-based system that puts a pressure sensor in the wheel for some reason. I was a big fan of the original one because it was the same concept as this. It was using existing information in the system in a clever way to basically data mine what's going on and come up with uh, some details. Do we have anything else going on over there, Mike? So no other questions at this time. Um, I think we have covered everything that's in here. It's a new system that's coming that's pretty interesting. Um, Dave Coleman is excited about it, and if Dave Coleman is excited about it, I will take that as a big thumbs up in terms of it's a good upgrade. Um, it's intended not as a crutch. Uh, it's intended basically just to make the car a little more we had a like, little better on turn in, a little better on corner exit, a little more stability in high speeds. Uh, one question we did have, I probably should have mentioned, is does it have the same effect as sway bars? In some effect, it'll have a little bit of the same, but it also doesn't have some of the drawbacks of, of sway bars. It won't affect your, uh, your weight transfer the way the roll stiffness does, I don't think. Um, it certainly won't have the head toss aspect you can get with oversized sway bars. It basically gives you that roll control without any other side effects. Again, with stiffer springs, same sort of thing. They can cut down on roll control as well, but they also have side effects in everything else and how the car moves. So this is just a little bit of less roll, a little, you know, get a little more on that inside wheel under certain situations. Okay, folks, since we shot that video yesterday, I've had a chance to talk a little more to Dave Coleman about this, and he's given me some information to answer some of our questions. First off, the turn-in behavior is mostly due to a slight weight shift from that deceleration from the rear wheels, and also because the decrease in roll is keeping the suspension in a happier part of its range. It's keeping it more in the middle of the range, less in the extremes, where you're more likely to run into things like bump stop interaction or toe change. So that's why the turn-in behavior is a little bit improved. On corner exit, what's happening is they're actually using a little bit more brake um, on that inside wheel to add a little bit of torque vectoring. Uh, Dave says that on a car with an open differential, it feels like you've got a weak limited slip differential. On a car with a limited slip differential, you feel like you get a much stronger drive off the corner. So that's done on purpose when you're on corner exit. It does add just a little bit more brake on that back to give a little more weight, um, torque transfer. You can actually turn the system off. Um, Dave and crew found out in track testing that if you're running very aggressive track pads, that the, uh, the KPC is actually a little bit of a liability. And the reason for that is because aggressive pads that you use on the track tend to be a little inconsistent, a little unpredictable at very, very light application pressures. So if you turn off the dynamic stability control, the KPC turns off at the same time. So if you don't want it to be activated, turn off the dynamic stability control, which you're probably doing on the track already, and it will go away. If you're running on stock pads, it is a benefit on the track. It is a win. You do get better lap times out of it. So it's worth keeping on if you're running stock pads. If you're running more aggressive tires, more aggressive pads specifically, you'll probably want to turn it off. And if you're interested in what this actually feels like on the road, that gives you a chance to, to test it A to B with and without. So thanks for your attention and back to your regularly scheduled programming. So if you have any more questions about this, please put them in the comments. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, all the usual social media stuff. We'll do our best to answer those. More information will be coming out about this system, I'm sure, as time goes on. But at the moment, that's everything we know. We're pretty excited about it. Thanks for tuning in. Keith Tanner here from Flamiata.